Section 1 of G.K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G.K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine by G.K. Chesterton. The Setback to English Socialism. The present condition of England is a very curious one, and the only obvious thing to say about it is that there is virtually nothing about it in the English papers. When I heard long ago that Mr. Balfour never read the papers, I thought it was because he was languid and frivolous, by which you will see that I did read the papers. Now I am older, I think it was more likely because he was practical and busy, and preferred to deal direct with the real facts. If, like the English, you run what is still at best an aristocracy with most of the forms of democracy, it is found virtually necessary that the journalist should talk in public about anything or everything except what the politicians are really doing in private. You may therefore utterly disregard all the things printed in very large letters in the Daily Mail or the Daily Chronicle. I have heard that American journalism is in a manner more truthful if it is only by being more transparently untrue. But I will not presume to guess about that or to imagine what the headlines in American papers mean. The headlines in English papers mean nothing. Mr. Bonar Law means nothing. Sir Edward Carson means nothing. Belfast means nothing. There is not one man of education and influence in England who cares a button about Belfast, at least in the governing classes, who have long seen that home rule is horse sense and nothing else. And least of all in the conservative party, where general high church flavor can be varied by Romanism, atheism, theosophy, Christian science, or devil worship, and where such a thing as a no-popery Puritan simply could not live for twenty minutes. Nor is there anything in Mr. Churchill's supposed frenzy for war or the other radicals' frenzy for peace. There is no more division among Englishmen about the need for national defense than there would be among you Americans or among Frenchmen or any other white men. And the mysterious ambitions and alterations of Mr. Churchill, of which you will see a great deal in the papers, mean nothing whatever but this, that the man is a cynic and an oligarch, but not a traitor, and that he is behaving exactly as any Englishman in his place would behave. There is more in the comparatively slight stir about the tragedy of the Titanic, for that was connected, though largely unconsciously, with what is the deepest thing in modern England, a general suspicion that the men and methods now on top everywhere are not the best even from their own paternalist point of view or to use the foolish modern phraseology that the survival of the unfittest rather than the fittest is the real result of our competitions or conspiracies but here again the very phrase reminds us that in the modern world the real issue is carefully cloaked with a false issue there's much in the english papers just now and i do not doubt in the american papers also about degeneration and eugenics and the appalling sexual conduct and physical condition of the submerged. This also is a mere plutocratic fad and corresponds to no general public feeling. Every sensible man in England knows that the poor must somehow or other be given more money for food and rest. But every sensible man also knows that in other respects they are as mixed and average as any other class and marry and are given in marriage as people always have done and always will do. The suspicion really abroad in England is not a doubt about the people below, but about the people above. Looking at those who emerge into the first social rank, we are more inclined to be ashamed of our successes than of our failures. It is the breed of the top dog rather than the breed of the bottom dog that is becoming a mongrel breed. And there is certainly something amusing in the picture of the rich and powerful peering down into the abyss and dropping tears over the poor specimens that make up the populace, while by far the greater part of the populace is remarking more and more 
what uncommonly poor specimens are looking down at them. This doubt of the powers that be is vague but universal, and had a sort of stifled explosion at the time of the Titanic affair. A general suspicion that governors cannot be trusted to govern, or inspectors to inspect, or arbiters to arbitrate. That captains are not to be trusted with ships, that lawyers are not to be trusted with laws. The kind of man who comes to the top everywhere conquers nothing but his superiors, gains nothing but his own again. In modern England, the successful man is not a success. Now this state of public feeling has produced one rather odd but very important effect. While our attitude is growing more revolutionary, it is growing less socialistic. For socialism proposes to give to the state, and therefore to statesmen, fresh powers against social abuses. And England, in its modern mood, is rather more suspicious of the statesmen than of the bosses or middlemen whom they are supposed to control. The simple socialistic formula that government should own the mines, for example, that simple formula begins to look a little too simple, when people are suspecting that the mine owners own the government. The mere proposal to set the politician to watch the capitalist has been disturbed by the rather disconcerting discovery that they are both the same man. We are past the point where being a capitalist is the only way of becoming a politician, and we are dangerously near the point where being a politician is much the quickest way of becoming a capitalist. But while the European haute politique is hypocritical and diseased, much more so, I should say, than the American, there is certainly less graft and corrupt give and take in the mass of minor functionaries or moderate fortunes. And this very comparative honesty in the less successful mass of Europe increases their uneasiness touching the national leadership. The English people, so far from being supine or decadent, are much more vigorous and wide awake than they have been for a long time. But they have awakened in a cage. This cage produces a curious situation in which we silently but suddenly find ourselves. When your nation, separated from our nation, to my present delight and yours, it separated before most men had become commercial wage earners. Our ruler was called Farmer George, but yours might have been called Farmer George also. Last week I went up to the great Sussex Road, where stands the village of Washington, and I remembered that your sword was also beaten out of a plowshare. If we had separated later, he might have been called General Brighton, or heaven knows what. Now the big difference made by that fact is this, that in America industrialism may be quite as strong, but agriculture is not so weak. A hazy horizon of free farms surrounds your most insane cities, but with us all the eager and intelligent have become servants of the capitalists. It is only the idle or idiotic that remain servants of the landlords. It is undoubtedly tenable that the idle and idiotic were the wiser of the two. On us thus situated has come an insurrection against industrialism itself. Our recent strikes have really been a revolt against the whole system of wage earning. But while your workers would have some cloudy notion of an alternative in farming the larger country by freer men, with us the agricultural alternative has slipped out of sight. The workers know what they don't want more than what they do like Miss Arabella Allen in Pickwick. This state of mind is called by the learned syndicalism. It is really something much more serious. It is anger. In the stress of these strikes, two extraordinary things happened. The capitalist became a socialist. The proletarian became an individualist. The employer wanted the community to intervene, and the employee didn't want it to intervene. It was the rich man who used the socialist argument the comfort and convenience of the whole nation. It was the poor man who used the individualist argument, the freedom of contract and the private rights of man. It was the coal owner who said, Celus populi suprema lex. It was the coal miner who said, Fiat justia ruat silum. He may not have expressed it precisely in those terms, though he is often no more illiterate than the coal owner. This, then, is the extraordinary inversion that is the deepest dilemma of England today. Hamlet and Laertes have really changed swords in the scuffle. 
Which is the poison sword, I will not at this moment inquire. The results of this extend and solidify every hour. For nearly a century now, socialists and social reformers in England, as in the rest of Europe and in America, have preached either greater philanthropy among the rich or greater rebellion among the poor. In both cases, they have been suddenly taken at their word, but in such a manner as to sweep away the very foundations of their social science and their social scheme. The rich have become philanthropists. The rich have, in a sense, become socialists, but only on condition that they may also be slave owners. The poor have become rebels, but rebels against socialism. So far is this from being an exaggeration that every daily detail in the present development illustrates this and nothing else. The railway men who led the revolt were not literally or legally striking against an employer at all. They were striking against the decision of state arbitration courts and conciliation boards such as state socialists would set up and semi-socialistic publicists had set up. The capitalists, wishing to strike back at the trade unions, have not struck back by cutthroat competition or irresponsible locking out. They have struck back by a big act of Parliament, aimed at limiting the trade unions by the law of the land, and tying men to their masters by a new and constructive social scheme. Here they have much the advantage of their proletarian opponents, who have to fight mainly with the remains, or rather rhetorical socialism and dreams, as yet somewhat dim of the old liberty of the medieval guilds and charters. Thus it may too often seem that capitalists can combine and socialists can only quarrel. I do not myself think things can be cured except by a wider equalization of strictly private property, especially in land. This is not done or even demanded, not because it is impossible, but because its tradition has been lost. Meanwhile, the Insurance Act, by which the rich contribute to the medical support of their servants, on condition of obtaining a tighter hold on their service, is the first of many legislative acts which will have for their object the ordering and cleansing, but also the strengthening of the wage system. They will attempt to forbid strikes. Thus we shall have the poor, with better conditions perhaps, and under some general social stipulations, but bound irrevocably to particular and private masters. The only thing I have to say about such a scheme concerns your country more than mine. This system of fixed service for certain masters has much to be said for it, and much was said by men dead and alive. In the wilderness by Chancellorsville, or down all the roads to Richmond, there must be the dust of great gentlemen who came up out of the South to fight for such a system. And I think our liberal social reformers owe them an apology. I think they ought to stand a moment and salute the dead, who had the courage to die for this thing, and the courage to call it by its name. End of section one. Section two of G.K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G.K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine by G.K. Chesterton On Divorce in War and Wedlock My dear McWhittlesey, yes, I'll try with pleasure to explain the remark you didn't quite understand. Perhaps the comparison will not seem so far-fetched as you think. The thing lies in my mind about like this. While in the east the monogamists are driving the polygamists from the battlefield, in the west the polygamists are trying to drive the monogamists into the divorce court. It may sound to you rather like a vulgar joke to say that the psychology of marriage is like the psychology of war, but indeed there is a great deal of truth in vulgar jokes, and the fallacy that weakens the modern protest against marriage is very like that which also weakens the protest against militant patriotism. The point, I think, is this. There are a certain number of things which really do work better by constant sifting, rejection and rapid exchange. We are all free traders to that extent. If you want the biggest chugger out in London to your music hall, it is roughly true that you will be wise to see a large number of chuggers out and even to pass a happy day watching them chuck one another out till you have found the perfect specimen. 
but this principle applies only to material goods. It breaks down if we attempt to extend it to things for which a frame of mind is necessary. Thus, it would not be the most practical way to obtain a strong patriotic army if the defeated always deserted to the conquerors, as did the Italian mercenaries in the later Middle Ages. If a soldier kept on leaving less successful armies till he found the most successful army, well, so recruited it would not be a very successful army. He would not really have found the best kind of force, nor would the force have received the best kind of soldier. For it is a part of the psychology of fighting to take the rough with the smooth, not to know when you are beaten or not to care. The qualities that can reach victory include a readiness to risk defeat, or, to put the matter another way, there are things such as chuckers out which are best changed frequently, but there are other things that can be made successful only if our loyalty to them is thought of as ultimately unchangeable, and one of these is a native land. This chivalry which in the chuckers out is not businesslike, but in the soldier is vitally businesslike, indeed virtually indispensable, has a parallel in the more chivalric or idealistic view of marriage. There are things best managed by competition and sorting. If a lady wants a hat that will exactly suit her, that will please her family by its beauty without ruining them by its expense, it is not unsafe to say that she had better try on a great many hats, nor does she commonly neglect this duty. But she will fall into philosophic error if she carries this theory in the choice of hats into the question of the choice of husbands, if she tries on a number of husbands rapidly one after the other. And the reason of this, don't you see, is not vague sentiment, but is perfectly rational. It will not make the hat a better hat that she would swear to be faithful to it forever. It might make the man a better man. Fresh flowers will not grow all over the hat because she smiles at it, but the most flowery virtues might blossom all over the gentleman. As there is a certain type of alleviation of the sorrows of war that can only come with a sense of fixed loyalty, so there is a certain kind of lightening of the real tragedies of sex, which can come only from a sense of complete confidence and permanent alliance. It is easier to walk among bullets with a final decision to die for England than to walk among the same bullets with a half-formed decision to desert tomorrow morning. And it is easier for a woman to face death in her fashion if both parties recognize a compact which can be taken for granted and walked about on like firm floor. Let me elaborate a little. There is another way in which the frame of mind fitted to war and marriage is useful. There is a certain kind of candor which is possible only under the implication of fidelity. The good patriot generally does his best work by abusing his country, but he would not be tolerated in this, nor would he have any effect except on the assumption of his being a good patriot. I may sometimes do some good and avert some wrong by saying, I am ashamed to be an Englishman, but all the good result vanishes instantly if I add, so I am going to be a Frenchman. When my house is raided by the police, my countrymen will forgive me for any number of anti-nationalist pamphlets or seditious printing presses they may find there, so long as they do not also find a Bedecker and some luggage labels. If I praise the Boers for sticking to the flag, it is on the tacit understanding that I mean, in the last resort, to stick to mine. If we all wander from one country to another as from one hotel to another, we should criticize less, not more. We should do as we do in the case of the hotels. We should very often leave the one we didn't like without even mentioning why we didn't like it. We should not be rooted enough to make revolutions. We should not be domestic enough to destroy. Exactly the same is true of marriage. One of the worst results I should anticipate from freer divorce would be a horrible increase of politeness. It would not be to anyone's interest to thrust things out, to ask fundamental questions, to cure radical vices, to attempt to understand. Human life would consist of exquisite curtsy and a cab at the door. This would be worst of all for the woman, for whatever else may or may not be, there is no doubt that rudeness, within reason, is one of the rights of woman. If the situation were permanently insecure, then there really would appear all those cajoleries and affectations which the feminists are so bitter about, but which are much more often found among the free women than among the wedded ones, and among the loose women 
than among the moral. It is largely from a desire to hold back this desolating flood of refinement that I regret the demand for divorce. Hoping that I have clarified my casual remark, I am, my dear Macwittosy, faithfully yours, G.K. Chesterton. End of section 2「Section 3 of G. K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine by G. K. Chesterton. Section 3 on the collapse of the International Club. My dear Mac Whittlesey, No, I have not become a pessimist. If I ever was an optimist, I am certainly one still. But to my mind, the only use of being an optimist about the universe is that one can the more boldly be a pessimist about the world. That you may see I can discern the good signals as well as the bad, I will tell you three recent things with which I am thoroughly delighted. With brazen audacity, I will even put first the one topic you know all about, and I know nothing about. I am thoroughly delighted with the election of the American president, with the election of the French president, and with the victory in the Balkans. You may think these three things have nothing to do with one another. Wait till I have done explaining things. It will not last long or hurt much. Don't imagine I have any newspaper illusions about any of the three. I am a journalist and never believe the newspapers. I know there will be a lot of merely fashionable fuss about the American and the French presidents. I know we shall hear how fond Mr. Wilson is of canaries or how interested Monsieur Poincaré is in yachting. It is truer still, of course, about the Balkan War. I have been anti-Turk through times when nearly everyone else was pro-Turk. I may therefore be entitled to say that much of the turnover of sympathy is pure snobbery. Silly fashions always follow the track of any victory. After 1870, our regiments adopted Prussian spikes on their helmets, as though the Prussians had fought with their heads like bisons. Doubtless there will be a crop of the same sort of follies after the Balkan War. We shall see the altering of inscriptions, titles, and advertisements. Turkish baths may be called Bulgarian baths. The sweetmeat called Turkish delight may probably be called Servian delight. A turkey carpet, very much kicked about and discolored, may be sold again as a Montenegro carpet. These cheap changes may easily occur. And in the same way, the international world, which consists of hotels instead of homes, may easily make the same mistake about the French and American presidents. Thousands of Englishmen will read the American affair as a mere question of Colonel Roosevelt. Thousands will read of the Poincaré affair as a mere echo of the Dreyfus case. Thousands have never thought of the Near East except as the Sultan, in Constantinople. For such masses of men, Roosevelt is the only American there ever was. For them, the Dreyfus question was the only French question there ever was. They had never heard that the Servians had a country, let alone an army. The fact in which the three events meet is this. They are all realities on the spot. Most Englishmen have never heard of Mr. Woodrow Wilson so they know that Americans really trust him. Most Englishmen have never heard of Monsieur Poincaré, so they know that Frenchmen know he is a Frenchman. Neither is a member of the International Club, the members of which advertise one another. Do you know what I mean? Do you not know that International Club? Like many other secret societies, it is unaware of its own existence. But there's a sort of ring of celebrities known all over the world, and more important, all over the world than any of them are at home. Even when they do not know one another, 
they talk about one another. Let me see if I can find a name that typifies them. Well, I have no thought of disrespect to the memory of a man I liked and admired personally, and who died with a tragic dignity fitted for one who would always long to be a link between your country and mine. But I think the late W. T. Stead was the unconscious secretary of that unconscious international club. The other members, roughly speaking, were Colonel Roosevelt, the German Emperor, Tolstoy, Cecil Rhodes, and somebody like Mr. Edison. In an interview with Roosevelt, Rhodes would be the most important man in England, the Kaiser, or Tolstoy, the most important man in Europe. In an interview with Rhodes, the Kaiser would be important, Mr. Edison more important, Mr. Stead rather important, Bulgaria and Monsieur Poincaré not important at all. Interview the Kaiser, and you'll probably find the only interviewer he remembers is Stead. Could Rhodes have been taken to Russia, you would probably find the only Russian he really heard of was Tolstoy. For the rest, the Nobel Prize, the Harmsworth newspaper group, the Marconi inventions, the attempts at a universal language. All these strike the note. I forgot the British Empire, on which the sun never sets. A horribly unpoetical state of things. Think of having a native land without any sunsets. The international club is breaking up. Men are more and more trusting, men they know to have been honest in a small way. Men faithful in one city to rule over many cities. Imperialists like Roosevelt and Rhodes stood for unrealities. Please observe that I do not for one moment say insincerities. Tolstoy was abundantly sincere, but the cult of him was an unreality to this extent, that it left large masses in America and England with a general idea that he was the only Christian in the east of Europe. Since then we have seen Christianity on the march, as it was in the Middle Ages, a thing of thousands, ready for pilgrimage and crusade. I don't ask you to like it, if you don't like it. I only say it's jolly different from Tolstoy, and equally sincere. It is a reality on the spot. Well, just as Russia and the Slavs meant for us Tolstoy, so France and French literature meant for many of us Zola. Poincaré's election represents a France that hates Zola more than the Balkans hate the Turk. The old definite, domestic, patriotic Frenchman has come to the top. I can't help fancying that with you, the old serious, self-governing, idealistic, and really Republican American has come to the top too. But there I speak of things I know not, and await your next letter with alarm. Faithfully yours, G. K. Chesterton. End of Section 3. Read by... Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 4 of G. K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. G. K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine by G. K. Chesterton Slavery and the American Store Talks to America In rereading the first and by far the best of the modern books on The Comedy of Childhood Helen's Babies, I note once more that you call a place a store when we should call it a shop. Ours is much the more vulgar phrase. You can put into a poem the peasant's simple store. You cannot put into a poem the peasant's simple shop. Not even if you are Mr. Maysfield. But I mention this for quite a different purpose. 
You know, it is always said that America and England are chiefly united by the tie of language. You also know that this is a great mistake. England is united to the continent of America by exactly the same ties which unite her to the continent of Europe. The continent of Europe is inhabited by Latins, Germans, Jews, Slavs, Scandinavians, and Celts. The continent of America is also inhabited by Latins, Germans, Jews, Slavs, Scandinavians, and Celts. America does not in the least belong to England. I thought the military operations round Saratoga had settled that in comparatively recent times. But America does belong to Europe because the Indians and the Irish and the Jews and the Scotch crofters come from Europe and could not have come from anywhere by those very real bonds which tie us to Russia. What they are is very soon discovered when the Russian meets a Japanese in the East or when a Californian meets him in the West. But on the language, I have long ceased to build much hope. My reason is that both the language strike me as being languages. American is not bad English. It is good American. In that lovely lyric on which the refrain is, O oh God, O oh Montreal, occurs, if I remember right, the couplet, Thou callest trousers pants, whereas I call them trousers. Therefore thou art in hell fire, and may the Lord pity thee. This seems to me a slightly narrow nay a nearly heretical view of the judgment upon sin the poet should have asked himself in a spirit of christian humility and self-examination why he called them trousers and why his transatlantic cousin called them pants if he had done so he would i think have found the two words were really symbols of the souls of two nations. First, if he, as an Englishman, had asked himself why he used the word trousers, he would have found that he did not know. That is the first great fact about the living tradition and living literature of England. That is the first grand and solid advantage of living in a very historic and protected community i do not know where the word trousers comes from i should guess it came from the french trouser and had something to do with what was called trussing the points of the old trunk hose but this is only a guess and a guess which it would bore me beyond words to verify. I do not know or care where the word trousers came from, but here exactly is the division of the nations. The Americans do know where the word pants came from. Obviously, it came from pantaloons and was quite deliberately shortened for quite practical purposes. If English words are mysterious, it is because they like to wander away from their original meaning and are thus slowly changed. If American words are mysterious, it is because they go straight to their meaning and are thus impatiently shortened. I think it was Charles V who said that fine thing. Whenever I learn a new language, I feel as if I had a new soul. If he had to learn American as well, to say nothing of Esperanto, he might 
have had more souls than he could save. But the man who could make that remark would have known that there really is a soul of America. It is not a mere jest drawn from the instance of pants and trousers. I could show the same thing in many other Anglo-American differences of phrase. In the charming American domestic tales I read in my boyhood, the thing that we call a railway station was always called a depot. Well, there is a great deal of national temperament in the two terms. An English man calls it a station because his instinct is to think of it as something stationary. He regards the village station as he does the village green or the village church, first as an object in a local landscape, second as an agreeable place where one has nothing to do. A railway train is a mere interruption in an English railway station, but this illogically and localism is not possible in the dry light and eager clearness of the American intelligence. The American calls it a depot because he realizes that the whole business in its nature hurried and temporary, that it is a place where things and people are deposited for a short time. The American reserves his antiquarianism for things that are really antique. He keeps his veneration for things that are really venerable. He does so with equal ease. Whether the object of his respect be the lost classism of the Parthenon or the almost equally lost classism of the Bunker Hill Monument, but the English have a sort of appetite for making things old and comfortable as quickly as possible. We shall soon be encouraging ivy on our railway stations as we encourage it on our parish churches. In a very little while, the London hansom cab will be quite literally as romantic as the Venetian gondola. But the strongest case is that difference between shop and store, which I have already mentioned. The American store may be as small as the smallest English shop. The English shop may be, and if certain modern trends continue, will be as large as the largest American store. Nevertheless, the difference is national that is natural. The abstract and ideal shopkeeper is a small shopkeeper. The abstract and ideal storekeeper is the manager of something like Herod's stores. You can have, as Napoleon said, a nation of shopkeepers. You cannot have a nation of storekeepers. They must of their nature tend to be the managers of most other men, that is the managers of most of the nation. That is, in this respect, and this respect only, that I think that the influence of your country upon mine has really been unfortunate. I should really like to know how you feel about this, for I think you know how I am above the mere prejudice of patriotism or the worst prejudice of anti-patriotism, or worse of all, the utter blinded prejudice of the cosmopolitan. All the colors are alike to the cosmopolitan. All colors always are alike to the man in the dark. And there is no darkness like that outer darkness, the heathen and homeless darkness in which the cosmopolitan dwells. But speaking as man to man, and therefore as nation to nation, don't you think there 
is something in my fear that your big businesses are providing us with the wrong model and all the more because it is a working model we talk cheaply here of america as without ancient history but indeed there is more really ancient history in america than in england and that because the republic of the united states started its career with two of the oldest and simplest institutions on this earth of both of which england had been ignorant for centuries of course i mean war and slavery we will toss away the topic of war i will only ask you whether you do not notice in the big shops the return of the idea of slavery can you think of any real difference between the workmen and the slaves except that the slaves were free already the employer is fining his workmen on all rational grounds of comparison he may soon be flogging his workmen the big businesses are becoming independent states as in the dark ages they are becoming despotic states as in the dark ages the one healthy and heroic civil war of modern times was fought in your country half a century ago you fought to resist the rise of an independent republic will you not fight to resist the rise of all these independent monarchies end of section four section number five of g k chesterton in the century illustrated magazine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christopher Gilson. G.K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine by G.K. Chesterton. Are the artists going mad? It is curious that while the word camouflage is incessantly used in numberless and needless applications, the thing itself finds no further use and is hardly applied at all. The term is a tag of journalese, some social or scientific movement is called camouflage, as if our noble language needed to search for a French word for humbug, or some great statesman is called a master of camouflage, when it would satisfy all our simple human needs to call him a liar. In this, perhaps, there is something of a national note, despite all the talk about the practicality of the British nation. In fact, no people is so easily fed with words instead of things, and with a sort of poetical justice instead of practical justice. For no people is satire so much a substitute for reform instead of a spur to reform. Bumbledom has passed into a proverb without by any means passing out of a practice. And we gave Kaiser Bill, that noisy war dog, a bad name instead of hanging him. But in the lighter aspects, at least, it is obvious that camouflage was one of the newest and most curious of the arts of war, and it seems odd that it has not been adopted as one of the arts of peace. To paint things with invisibility would seem to be a military miracle, almost as suggestive as the miracles of the latest surgery. It would be almost as humane an act to remove certain features in a landscape as to restore certain features in a face. Many of our large buildings, our public monuments, and even the statues of our great men might often, with advantage, be made to melt into a confused twilight of distance, so that their lines were indistinguishable. For that matter, whole cities in the wealthiest, most bustling, and business-like district of the British Empire seem to call for the subtle brush that would make them look like something else that would enable the traveller to walk through a commercial high street with the illusion of one walking through a wild woodland glade and to wander in Sheffield as if it were Sherwood. Nor, indeed, is there any reason why the new kind of painting should not be applied to the old kind of painting. The entire exhibition of the Royal Academy, 
might be painted in so subtle a manner that the pictures themselves were invisible. Outside landscape painting and portrait painting, there are forms of the pictorial art in which such an intervention would be highly interesting. The one school of painting in which the modern world certainly excels, at any rate in enthusiasm and energy, is the painting of the female face. It would be disrespectful to suggest that we often desire the face to be camouflaged in the sense of completely conjured away and evaporated, but there are composed and even complacent human countenances of gentlemen and even of ladies which would be more soothing if they appeared to fade into a pattern like a portion of the wallpaper, or if they could be mistaken at the first glance for a bedpost or a sofa cushion. There are perhaps ideals too high and remote to be realized, but they serve to introduce a real question about the technical condition of such arts today. It does appear strange that the galleries of advanced art have not shown us a camouflaged school along with the cubist school or the futurist or vorticist schools. The conception of the next step in aesthetic progress being an invisible art is very much in line with the others, or even with the very names of the others. A vortex is in its nature the empty centre of something tending to vanish, and if, as humanity in its simplicity has hitherto supposed, the future is hidden from us, the thing after the future is presumably more invisible still. And as for cubism, there is nothing beyond the cube unless there be a fourth dimension, and pictures in the fourth dimension would be happily beyond our vision. Well, let us suppose that this fact smooths a path for the fashionable triumph of the camouflage school of art. Let us suppose, for the sake of argument, that some practical joker has left the walls of Burlington House entirely bare and then invited all society to the private view. Suppose he explains that the pictures of the new school are painted with such superb skill that they mix themselves with the atmosphere, that they are absorbed into the air and the environment that they dissolve by their very sympathy with daylight, or, in short, that they create the delicate illusion of not being there at all. I wonder how many people in such a society crowd would submit to the new situation and profess an understanding of the new metaphysic and the new technique. I wonder if any would have the moral courage to say of the academy walls what the child alone had courage to say about the emperor. For the first thing to face about the progress of the arts at present is that, whatever the rights and wrongs of it otherwise, it is supported by masses of social hypocrisy. Of the artists themselves, of those of them that can really be called artists, of such motives and meanings as can really be traced to a true artistic source, I shall try to take account in all fairness later on. But even if it be in originality and courage that they are admirable, it is in civility and cowardice that they are admired. Merely to wish for advanced art is not anarchism, it is simply snobbishness, and snobbishness more vulgar than the vulgarest worship of rank and wealth. For, after all, there is at least a low sort of sincerity in that sort of snobbery. Rich people can give their psychophants solid pleasure of a sort, for which they can be thanked without falsehood, and it is a shade more honest for men to praise a patron for the champagne and cigars they do enjoy than for the pictures and statues they only pretend to enjoy. But as these great revolutions in art are never patronized by anybody except the very rich, we shall all be relieved to hear that the two different types of snobbishness can generally be practiced at the same dinner table. Anyhow, the fashion in these things is almost always some form or other of intellectual cowardice, and many eminent persons say to one another, a very interesting experiment, or an attempt to approach life from a new angle, when if they were moved suddenly to candor, they would look at one another and say, are all the artists going mad? In one respect, at least the artists are really to blame. The artists, in the narrower sense of the painters, 
are in one sense very narrow indeed. They are progressive, that is, they deal in terms of time and not of eternity. It is odd to notice how the very titles given to the new schools have often referred only to the sequence of time, just as if one controversialist were called a Thursdayite and the other completely eclipsed him by being a Fridayite. We see this in the very name of post-impressionist and in the very name of futurist. It is equally idle for a man to boast of coming after something he does not like and of coming before something he cannot know. In the latter case, a man is merely fleeing to the future as to a sort of refuge. In the former case, it is clear that a post-impressionist style cannot score by being after impressionism any more than a pre-Raphaelite style can by being before Raphael. The value must be in some intrinsic qualities apart from order or sequence, and in that sense the names of cubist and vorticist are more rational even if the things themselves do not convince every one of their rationality. But touching this matter of time, there does seem to be a rather peculiar quality about modern painters. I have never understood why painters are so much more terrified than poets or prose writers of the notion of being behind the times. It seems probable at present that they will really find themselves behind the times. They will find themselves the last people left alive to believe in this silly 19th century notion of being in advance of the times. All the thinkers who really think and all the theorists whose theories seriously count are growing more and more skeptical about the very existence of progress and certainly about the desirability of this sort of self-swallowing and suicidal kind of progress. The notion that every generation proves worthless the last generation and is in its turn proved worthless by the next generation is an everlasting vista and vision of worthlessness which is fortunately itself worthless. Curiously enough, there is scarcely any group left that really thinks it worth worrying about except this particular group of the painters of pictures. When Mr. Hugh Walpole first showed his fine talents as a young novelist, he did not think it necessary to maintain that Mr. Thomas Hardy was an old fool. Recognising that Mr. W. B. Yeats was a good poet did not involve regarding Swinburne as a bad poet. But Whistler and the Impressionists were wildly anxious to show that they were in revolt against the Pre-Raphaelites and Post-Impressionists were equally crazy about having cut themselves clear of the Impressionists. In their case indeed, as I have suggested, the very name given to them seemed to denote a monomania of rivalry. Impressionism, at least, meant something if it meant something like scepticism. The gentlemen of the jury want none of the impressions on your mind, said the barrister to Mr. Winkle, which I fear would be of little service to honest, straightforward men. Still, the impressionist obviously had received an impression, even if the honest, straightforward men of the Philistine world, gazing at his misty river or cloudy woodland, felt that it had made rather a faint impression. It is human to receive an impression of something, but it is doubtful if anybody ever received a post-impression of anything. The new schools soon learned to secure less progressive and therefore more logical names, but that first accident of nomenclature revealed the strange theory of revolutionary succession on which aesthetic thought was running at the time. For this preliminary progressive pose, the painters themselves are largely responsible. Nevertheless, the first step toward justice to their originality must be to ignore their novelty. The only way of judging the schools that call themselves new is to imagine what we should think of them if they were old. Before attempting to set these new studies in these ancient lights, there is a parenthesis here. In the philosophy of art, certainly, there has recently been an abrupt revolution and, in my view, a most beneficent revolution. But by being revolutionary, it proves it is not progressive. Revolution is always the reverse of progress, for revolution is reversal of direction. By no possibility can the Impressionist's progress in optics 
be continued in the cubist contempt for optics. But the division is even deeper. It was the whole point of Whistler and his school that they produced the picture without troubling about the meaning. We may say it is the point of Picasso and the rest that they paint the meaning without troubling to paint the picture. With them, the inmost idea is everything and the impression is nothing. A scoffer must be content to say that the impressionist called a woman an arrangement and the futurist calls an arrangement a woman. At the one extreme was a portrait of a lady in which the face was actually left out lest it should look intelligent and so rival the tones of dress and background. At the other is the portrait of an Englishwoman in the little brochure called Blast which consisted wholly of rods and squares mathematically symbolizing merely the mystery of her soul. One may fancy that her soul escaped even this analysis, but it is something that men are now searching for the soul. It is something that the materialism of the technical time has given place to such shameless mysticism. Now, I am well aware that there is a mass of new literature devoted to the exposition of the new art, and that in this all sorts of metaphysical and psychological explanations can be found for each of the different schools in turn. Thus, to take the simplest example, I have seen a picture by an eminent painter representing the dazzle and vivacity of a cafe in which a lady, possibly the barmaid, had one eye in one corner of the picture while her teeth smiled in a similar isolation in another corner. I have also seen a printed philosophical explanation of this picture which appeared to be pointing out that the impression of rush and rapid gesture could be conveyed only by distributing the lady in this way. It was dynamic art, as distinct from the static art to which humanity has hitherto been harshly limited. In the same way, I have seen an explanation of cubism as giving to painting the dimensions hitherto confined to sculpture just as the scattered features described above were supposed to give to painting the dynamics hitherto confined to drama, to all of which I am quite content to answer that they do not give it. I venture to put aside all these metaphysical and psychological arguments, because in such a case they are arguments in a circle. These men may be justified in using an eccentricity for the sake of an effect, but they cannot go back and prove the effect from the eccentricity. It cannot be logical to excuse a method because it makes a point so plain, and then to explain that the point must remain obscure until we understand the method. Rush and rapidity of movement are very vivid things, and if there is a way of producing them, even an unscrupulous or unbalanced way of producing them, we shall know when they are produced. But when I meet with a human eye in my travels, round one corner of a canvas, and later on encounter a smile all by itself like the Cheshire Cat in another corner, I do not receive any sense of rush or rapidity. It has no suggestion of dynamics, though to some humorists it might suggest dynamite. To me, it does not suggest even that, but merely a sort of meaningless and untidy pattern. I leave out the question of whether, in any case, a picture ought to be dynamic when it is obviously destined to be static. I can imagine that the most sympathetic critic, when he had sat opposite that striking picture for ten or twelve years, where it hung in the place of honour in his dining room, would at last begin to think that the crisis of the scattered lady might well be past, and that she might possibly, so to speak, pull herself together. But I willingly admit that this applies in a lesser degree to any picture of action, as action is expressed in sloping limbs or flying drapery. The point here is that the philosophers certainly have not proved, either in theory or practice, that lost teeth and lonely eyeballs are a better image of motion than the limbs or drapery in the sense of a more immediate or informing image. I think they mean at best that it is a fresher image for those who are tired of the limbs and drapery, having had them in the dining room for ten years. And that brings us back to the point reached before the beginning of this parenthesis. 
The only sense in which any art has any business to be new is that in which the most ancient, even the most antiquated, art is new. If a young artist can really assure us it has all the novelty of the pyramids, or that it is as fresh and up-to-date as the Parthenon, we may really look forward to his doing something unexpected. For it is the definition of the old masterpieces that we cannot expect them even when we have seen them. About all great work there lingers a white light as of morning, which is the original wonder at their being done at all. The mystical way of putting it is to say that any act of creation has in it something which shows man as the image of his creator. The practical way of putting it is that another man can often see the thing depicted more clearly in the copy than in the original. And it is perfectly true, as the modern artists say more excitedly, but all artists say more or less moderately, that in order to waken this spirit of wonder, the copy must never be quite a correct copy. There must always be something in it to show that it has passed through the wandering mind of man, that man has deliberately set it in a new light, sometimes by selection and omission, sometimes by the wildest exaggeration. These are the truisms of the topic, but, like other truisms, they tend to be hidden much more deeply than heresies. It is not a condemnation of a work of art to say that it is not realistic, but it is a condemnation of it to say it is not idealistic, in the sense of pointing toward this ancient ideal of art, the awakening of the mood of wonder. Whether the more ungainly modern tricks do awaken it, we will discuss in a moment. But the distinction between the idealistic criticism of them and the merely realistic criticism which many would offer must first be made clear. It can be made clear enough for convenience by an old and familiar anecdote of the arts. It has often been recalled, in reply to realistic complaints, the Turner answered a critic who complained that he had never seen such clouds by saying, Don't you wish you could? It is not so often realized that the phrase does actually provide a very practical test for a distinction between some artistic falsifications and others. It really is true that any man of moderate imaginative culture does wish he could see some of Turner's sunset clouds too scarlet to be mortal blood, and too bright to be earthly fire. But it is not equally self-evident, to say the least of it, that any man wishes he could see one of Mr. Epstein's statues walking about the street in the monstrous function of a man. I am not here denying that the Epstein monster may touch the nerve of wonder in another way. I am only pointing out that Turner's saying, so often quoted, and so seldom applied, does subject these things to another test, which is perfectly rational, but not in the least realistic. There is a real difference between the exaggeration of which we can effectively ask, don't you wish you could, and the other exaggeration of which we can promptly reply, no, I thank God I can't. There is another point about Turner's appeal to the imagination of the spectator himself and even of the carping critic himself. The tragedy of humanity has been the separation of art from the people. Indeed, it is a queer fact that the same progressives who insist that government shall be democratic often insist that art must be oligarchical and the public, which is a god, when they are talking about votes and statues, becomes a brute when they are talking about books and pictures. But there are wiser men of genius, such as Tolstoy and William Morris, who have clearly perceived the inhumanity and perilous pride of merely aristocratic art. They have sought to bridge the abyss between the sense of beauty and the sentiment of humanity, and those who have most studied it have agreed with Morris that it was most nearly bridged in the Middle Ages. The medievals knew that a normal man does wish he could see a cloud of scarlet and gold, and therefore they were not sparing of scarlet and gold in their illuminated manuscripts or their church windows. 
If any one had complained that he had never seen St. Michael in golden armor with crimson wings, they would certainly have answered with the most orthodox propriety, Don't you wish you could? They also knew that the normal man likes monsters, grotesque and fantastic forms as strange as any in the studio of a modern sculptor. Only from motives of lucidity, they labelled them dragons and demons instead of admirals and society ladies. In other words, they did it in such a way that while the angel was quite free to soar and the devil to dance far out of the reach of the realist, the meaning of these things was not missed by a class more numerous than realists, and that is real men and women. They united all men in the spirit of wonder, from the most cunning craftsman who wondered at the thing being carved beautifully, to the most ignorant rustic who wondered at it being carved at all. And this was sound philosophy, for, properly considered, the wonder of the rustic is even more reasonable than the wonder of the craftsman. It is really in that sense a miracle that it should be carved at all. A monkey cannot do it, and when a man does it, he is exercising a divine attribute. This is what gives their strange poetry to the primitives, that the people were in a certain simple but very sane mood in which they could wonder at the most primitive work. In that sense, they could wonder even at bad work. And we may fairly say that the moderns are now trying to do bad work in order to have something to wonder at. I do not make it as a point against them. On the contrary, I think it is the only real case for them. The wisest among them saw that the power of the primitives consisted in being primitive, in awakening the primal wonder. They saw that their very crudity somehow records the great creative birth or transition. It amounted in practice to the experiment of making ugly things that they might recover an astonishment no longer accorded to beautiful things. One of those few great Frenchmen who found it all that was sincere in the movement said to somebody, I am trying to surprise myself. When we have understood that sentence, we have understood everything that can rightly and sympathetically be urged for the eccentricities of the new art. All the rest of it, and by far the greater part of it, is vulgar quackery and brazen incompetence. The average artist of the sort is a man who paints an unconventional picture because he has not enough originality to paint a conventional one. But the few men of genius who began the dance had an idea in their heads, and it is only by understanding it that we can understand the answer to it. The real weakness of the best of the new primitives is that their quaintness does not arise out of a universal world of wonder, but rather out of a world without wonder. It comes not from simplicity, but from satiety. The shepherds who watched the first sketches of Giotto were surprised that he could draw a face, and therefore still more surprised that he could draw a beautiful face. But the modern Giotto is tired of beautiful faces and feels that there might yet be a surprise in the drawing of ugly faces. The modern painter, in the phrase I have already quoted, is trying to surprise himself. To judge by some of the society beauties he paints, we might say that he is trying to frighten himself. And there would be this degree of serious truth in it, that this typical sort of modern artist whatever else he is, is primarily a self-tormentor. At the best, he is pinching himself to see if he is awake, not having about him the real white daylight of wonder to keep him wide awake. At the worst, he is sticking pins all over himself to find the one live spot, as the witch-finders of a livelier age did it to find the one dead spot. I am not sure that even the old picture of the live people brought to death is more horrible than the new picture of such dead people brought to life. Anyhow, it is surely obvious that there is no permanent progress that way, that we cannot really be rejuvenated by becoming more and more jaded, or making mere insensibility a spur to sensations. Still less, of course, do we so come any nearer to our problem of the revival of popular art. If the mob does not always enter into the feelings of geniuses, 
At least he cannot be asked to enter into all the feelings of lunatics or men whose methods are as individual and isolated as the maniacs of an asylum. The real solution does not lie that way, but exactly the opposite way. It does not lie in increasing the number of artists who can startle us with complex things, but by increasing the number of people who can be startled by common things. It lies in restoring relish and receptivity to human society, and that is another question and a more important one. It is enough to say here that it not only means making more giottos, but also making more shepherds. It might be put defiantly by saying that the great modern need is to uneducate the people. I do not mean merely uneducate the populace, I mean more especially uneducate the educated. It might be put much more truly by saying, as we have to say at the end of so many entirely rationalistic inquiries, that what the modern world wants is religion or something that will create a certain ultimate spirit of humility, of enthusiasm, and of thanks. It is not even to be done merely by educating the people in the artistic virtues of insight and selection. It is to be done much more by educating the artists in the popular virtues of astonishment and enjoyment. It is not to be achieved by the artist leaving the crowd further and further behind in his wild goose chase, nor even by the crowd running hard enough to keep up with the artist, but rather by the artist turning round and looking at the crowd and realising that it is rather more interesting than a whole flock of wild geese. End of section 5「Section 6 of G.K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T.R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. G.K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine by G.K. Chesterton, Section 6. The Patriot of the Planet Touching the later work of Mr. H. G. Wells, there is a reflection that must have occurred to many of his readers, though it seems hardly to have been noticed by many, if any, of his critics. His first fantastic books may well throw a light, if a somewhat lurid light, on his last serious books. One of his most recent and most serious books, the salvaging of civilization, is an eloquent and effective plea for a world state or single international nation. It suggests that we should feel a patriotism for the whole planet, and this should surely remind the reader of those noble nightmares in which Mr. Wells once imagined the defense of the whole planet against the monsters of another planet, it is certainly an irony that the man who has ended with the notion of the peace of the world should have begun with the notion of the war of the worlds. And it is certainly a symbol that the first of the strange stars with which we can be conceived as coming into contact is a star that bears the name of Mars. The monsters of Mr. Wells's are certainly martial, as well as Martian. And though Mr. Wells would now probably repudiate the moral, I really believe that he had then found the method. There would be a much stronger motive for this planetary patriotism in the thing he invented as a fancy than in anything he adduces as a fact. If he really wishes us to extend our political loyalty to the whole human race and our political frontiers to the whole terrestrial globe, there is no doubt about the practical thing which he ought to do. Let him merely introduce some three-legged giants from Mars. Let him arrange for a visit from those monsters with their tripods, like goblins stalking about on stilts, a mere trifle for a man of his talents. Then I will promise him that we shall all feel the solidarity of the human race and even possibly something of the sanctity of the earth 
that is their mother. And so far as that is concerned, I shall rejoice with him heartily. But it may well be doubted whether most men will vividly imagine the earth unless they imagine something beyond the earth. It may well be doubted whether they will really conceive the world at all, so long as they conceive the world as the universe. There is one man who might really restore that sense of the central monarchy of man, for which Mr. Wells makes a moving appeal, and he is the man in the moon. Some would indeed suggest that Mr. Wells himself is rather like the man in the moon, that he has something of his pallid abstraction, something of his almost inhuman detachment. But I have never agreed with this criticism of his literary personality. It seems to me that the very reverse of merely rigid and mathematical and mechanically efficient. It strikes me as rather especially sympathetic, sensitive, and slightly irritable. As the politician described decimal points as damned little dots, I suppose it is possible that the little dots with which Mr. Wells's suggestive impressionist sentences so often tail off and fade away should be mistaken for the mathematical exactitude of decimals. But he does not mean them for decimal points, but only for damned little dots. Hence, I do not compare the author himself to the man in the moon, but I think it in accordance with his own original imaginative instinct to say that a man in the moon would really remind us of the sacred supremacy of a man on earth. If once that pale but luminous being began to extend his silver scepter over our earth, I think we should all resist and refuse to be moonstruck. Nor should I say, as many would, that Mr. Wells resembles the man in the moon as described in the nursery rhyme in the fact that he came down too soon or, in other words, is in advance of his age. It would be truer to say that he came down too late. It is a curious fact that the nearest that the world ever came to the world state of Mr. Wells was in the Roman Empire, and there, when he has got it, he does not like it. In the artistic sense, at least, I cannot help wishing the thing were one of the old romances instead of one of the new pamphlets or lectures. I wish the artistic energy which described the adventure of the first men in the moon were occupied with the militant defiance of the last men on earth. Taken in that sense, as an allegorical picture or poem, there would be nothing but nobility in the vision of the patriots of a planet and there would be a splendid playground for the fancy in such planetary patriotism. I like to imagine what might be made of the banners and uniforms of the Orbis Terrarum, and whether they would be green for the vegetation or blue for the sea. Perhaps the soldiers of the human nation would be clad in some earthly red to represent the clay from which came the giant limbs of Adam. Perhaps, as some regiments bore the badge of a skull and crossbones, the uniforms would be barred, as with the ribs of skeletons, to represent the dignity of the vertebrates. Perhaps our pride and pomp would repose rather on our being bipeds, which would seem natural enough if we were fighting against tripods. In that case, we should carry a sort of cloven pennon into battle, and die about the banner of the sacred trousers. These are pleasing meditations, and I do not mean them to be merely flippant, still less to be merely hostile. All criticism of the last work of Mr. Wells must begin with the proposition that his fundamental doctrine of human brotherhood is profound and true, and well worthy to inspire an imaginative art which need be none the less sincere for being fantastic art. But indeed, this sense of the sanctity of man, as against the background of what is outside man, is by no means merely a fantastic problem, or one involving merely fantastic difficulties. It is not necessary to procure three-legged monsters from Mars in order to raise a question about the supremacy of man on Earth. There are many who raise that question about the four-legged monsters who are already on the earth. 
There are many animal lovers who are very near to being animal worshipers and whose ethics often involve something rather like human sacrifice to animals. And curiously enough, these animal lovers would often be the same social idealists who would be most anxious to assist Mr. Wells to efface frontiers and abolish wars. Nobody believes less in the supremacy of humanity than the humanitarian. He also wishes to abolish frontiers, and he wishes to abolish the frontier between men and monkeys, and possibly between men and Martians. He also wishes to avoid wars, and would probably refuse the challenge of the War of the Worlds. He would probably be found recommending that the lunar or Martian invaders should be taught only with kindness. He would be discovered being tender to a tripod. In short, I see no reason to suppose that this sort of pacifist would be a planetary patriot or a human patriot any more than any other sort of patriot, or that he would be necessarily loyal to the world state any more than he is to the national state. He would go on with a process which he would call broadening his sympathies and other people would call betraying his kind. Nor is the humanitarian eccentric, of course, the only person who could quarrel with a theory based on the dignity or divinity of all men. The principle applies not only to the humanitarian, but to the type which somebody has well defined as brutalitarian. The brutalitarian will not admit that men are brothers and will continue to claim the right to treat aborigines as animals. On the ground that black men are brutes, he will make sure that white men shall be brutes. And he will find quite as much support for his sophistries in science and modern thought as any other skeptic will find for any other kind of skepticism. The brutalitarian can argue as easily from the example of nature as the humanitarian can from the unity of nature. Nor can I see how, on purely rationalistic grounds, that one can be coerced for calling a tiger his brother or the other for making a tiger his model. With this, we collide with the whole cosmic question of religion and philosophy, and I doubt whether so colossal a scheme can be made to revolve upon the mere divinity of man without some admitted doctrine about the nature of man about the original and spiritual status of man. Even the men of a world state, one would imagine, would require something resembling a reason for thinking their own race more sacred than all other animals, or their own star more sacred than all other stars. And here we come again to the necessity of a world church as the only chance for a world state. But this is a larger question indeed the largest of all questions, and the question I wish to answer first concerns the more combative sort of planetary patriotism, once evoked so vigorously in the War of the Worlds. It is true of almost anything that he who defends it defines it. Defense involves definition either in conducting a controversy or constructing a fort. The wall round a city is not merely a precaution against the city being destroyed. It is also the process by which the city is created. This is the truth of psychology, which really feeds the passion of patriotism and even of militant patriotism. The things we love, the things we think beautiful, are things of a certain shape which we recognize. Imagination has very little to do with infinity. Imagination has to do with images. The French decadent poet desired to fall in love with a giantess, but nobody could fall in love with a woman who was too large to be seen. I am not now discussing the proper proportion of this psychological need to other moral and social needs, such as peace and order. I am pointing out that this is a psychological need from which nationalism has sprung and which the internationalists have to stifle or satisfy. It is not mere militarism or bloodlust or biological nonsense about man being a fighting animal. It is not merely the desire to hate what is outside, but also the desire to make sure that what we love is inside. 
And it is this that has made a halo of romance round all armed defense. It is not the fort that beautifies the frontier, but rather the frontier that beautifies the fort. War would really have been the vain and vulgar butchery that the pacifists call it, but for this beauty and intensity in the idea of independence. A sword is not in itself a fairy wand to charm anything or anybody. A sword is only an unusually aggressive sort of spike. It becomes a fairy sword by defending fairy land. An invader rushing on the spears might in itself have been as unpleasant a sight as an intruder impaled on spikes. The point is that the spiked wall is a garden wall, but above all that, it is a living wall and more like a hedge with thorns than a wall with spikes. It is a living wall made of the men who love the garden. Indeed, something of this truth of separation and selection has been the dubious palliation, but the genuine explanation even of imperial and tribal adventures. The common phrase about carving out a kingdom has that amount of truth in it that a man cannot even create it without limiting it. It is the whole point of a sculptor carving a statue that he refuses the rock. That is, he will not be satisfied with anything so insignificant as the whole. But no imperial adventures, no carving out of kingdoms, can ever approach or be worthy to approach the direct purity of this passion as it exists in defense. Then indeed, it is true to say that the nation is like a garden and the army like a hedge, and there is a moment of mystical illumination and indignation when the hedge is more beautiful than the garden. Our own country is never really herself save in those rare moments when she is in danger of invasion. No gropings or grabbings in remote colonies or commercial markets would give anyone a notion of that secret garden or the living hedge that stood around it for five terrible years in the dark time when the thieves out of the northern forests found that there were thorns upon the English rose. In short, men fight for the nation at the worst because they believe in the nation, and at the best, because they believe in nations. They defend these human subdivisions because they value them, and sometimes because they value subdivision itself. But are they valuable, and are they worth defending? That is obviously the next question we have to consider. It is not an easy question to answer, not because the answer is doubtful, but because it is so multitudinously manifest. It is also an understatement to say that our history is bound up with our country. History simply means humanity, and humanity itself, especially all that is called the humanities, is come to us in a national shape. The reason that a man will not allow his national life to be lost is that he does not know how much of his human life would be lost with it. He will not exchange a complex reality for an abstraction. He fears that, in another sense, it would be an abstraction, or at any rate, a subtraction. There is an inner truth in that triad evoked by the great English romantic for England, home, and beauty. Just as a man cannot abruptly dissolve any beautiful work of art into its elements, or decide suddenly which words or colors are essential, so he cannot abruptly break up and analyze the unity called home or the unity called England. Short as was my visit to America, I wandered long enough lost in the vast plains of the Middle West to have flying fits of homesickness and to see in a vision of strange vividness the sight and scenery of my home. Suppose a mad millionaire, like some who run wild in those parts, had walked up to me and offered to build then and there on the prairie the thing I called my home, or an exact replica of my home. Suppose, if I murmured something about a row of elm trees, he instantly proposed to plant them, if only in a row of pots. Suppose I grew sentimental over the skylark, and he rapidly arranged to bring over skylarks in cages, or in an enormous aviary suspended from an enormous aeroplane. 
Perhaps the Skylarks could be trained to follow the aeroplane as seagulls follow the ship. For I know that aviation, at its best, is only skylarking, just as I know that Mr. Wells with his Martians and men in the moon is only skylarking. And I can imagine Mr. Wells writing another fantastic and fascinating romance about the experiment of my mad millionaire in reproducing all the atmosphere and conditions of England in the Middle Plains of America. For instance, I should certainly miss the clouds, for the clouds of England are as beautiful in one day as the clear skies of America in another. I do not know whether there is any tariff or duty on importing sunset clouds into the strictly protected territory of the land of the setting sun, but in Mr. Wells' imaginary romance, I prefer to fancy the sunset clouds would be carefully produced by chemical combinations on the spot. I am quite sure that he knows enough about the laws of light and vapor and evaporation to give a plausible account of how any such atmospheric conditions were created. I like to think of the colossal power stations and tanks and tubes away behind the scenes of the artificial landscape, busy piling up cumuli or carefully manufacturing a thunderstorm. I really think Mr. Wells would enjoy himself in pretending to be that mad millionaire, and I respectfully offer him the notion. There is a great deal of talk about construction just now, construction of cities and civic institutions, town planning and housing, and all the rest of it, but I doubt if anyone has really tried to construct a climate. Nobody has been bold enough to build the weather in the manner of the mad millionaire of my dreams. It would certainly be a new and literal way of creating a new heaven and earth. But for all that, the mad millionaire would really be mad. He would have set himself an impossible and indeed intrinsically illogical task. If Mr. Wells is the fine artist that I take him for, he would finish off the story with a failure, and a failure on some point apparently small but fatally serious. It would be impossible, really, to reproduce for the exile the thing he calls home, for the exile does not remember everything he wants, even when he knows it is all he wants. He remembers the wall or hedge that runs round the garden, but he cannot be expected to give a botanical catalogue of all the plants in the garden, even of the plants that please him most. He knows that the life he loves is found within certain frontiers, and the only simple definition of it is to state the frontiers. To the exile in the prairies, the word home might cover half a hundred things, from a cat to a collection of butterflies. But he knows, for all that, that it is one thing, and that it is well described by that one word. He can never be certain that any other word, especially an abstract word, will cover the same thing, and he suspects that in shifting to Utopia, USA, some of the butterflies will be lost in the move. The plants may not bear transplantation, and the cat may go back to the old home. But there is a further difficulty for the mad millionaire making his model of a home from home. He cannot recreate the charm exactly, because the charm was partly in the inexactitude. When the traveler really goes home, the thing that may make him feel most at home may be a book upside down in the bookcase, or a stake leaning crooked in the fence. It is often through seeing something in the wrong place that he realizes he has come to the right place. It is rather especially, if anything, an English eccentricity, though it has other forms in all other nations. Indeed, the English domestic ideal is best indicated in the English nursery rhyme about the adventures of the crooked man who went a crooked mile and found a crooked sixpence against a crooked style. Certainly, in the personal case, there is something that moves me profoundly about that elfish rhyme. I will not here discuss the delicate question of whether I myself am crooked. It may be enough to concede that, like space in Einstein, I am curved. 
but it will be generally agreed among my friends that my style on which I lean is likely to become a crooked style, and that if there is a sixpence lying about, I am very likely to tread on it and turn it into a crooked sixpence. But above all, whether or no I am a crooked man, I am proud and happy to say that I always walk a crooked mile whenever I walk up any of the country roads to my house, and that is an excellent example of this indispensable irregularity, not only as a note of the home, but as a note of the nation. The English roads are very much more crooked than convenience requires and any Englishman ought to be ready to die rather than to see them put straight. To show that this is indeed the note of a nation, I may refer in passing to the parallel of language, which is the very voice of a nation. Here again, what is really difficult to render is the irregularity, and not merely the regularity. We hear much of the translator's task in turning good English into good French, but the real test of a good translator would be turning bad English into bad French. It would be getting the word that is wrong in the right way, instead of merely right in the wrong way. How could the translation, however literary, convey the idea of something that is humorous because it is illiterate? And some of the most English masterpieces are literary because they are illiterate. It has been noted that when we speak of England, we mean one thing, which is also a thousand things, from a dog to a Dickens novel. But it is equally true that when we speak of a Dickens novel, we mean one thing, which is also a thousand things, including some deliberately perverse and imperfect things. When the elder Mr. Weller says that circumvented is a more tenderer word than circumscribed, I think the translator will have difficulty in finding a word even equally tender. I think the international language, like the international state, will indeed find itself circumscribed and will find that the national tongue and temper have very decidedly circumvented it. When the same invaluable coachman comments on the condolences of his wife and Mr. Stiggins, who visit Sam in prison only to sit on each side of his fireplace and groan, he merely asks Sam whether he does not feel his spirits rose by the visit. I do not feel my own spirits rose by the prospect of finding a Frenchman who could find a French past participle to convey the exact nuance of nonsense in that English past participle. In short, the thing has not only got to be wrong, but got to be wrong in the one way that is right. And that is precisely the point about this touch of crookedness in the creations of these local loves of humanity. The picturesqueness of the nursery rhyme landscape is concerned not only with the mile and the style being crooked, but with precisely how crooked they are. It is a question of the exact angle of absurdity at which the thing can still stand upright. And just as a man will not simply exchange English for Esperanto, so he will not simply exchange England for the earthly paradise, especially when he knows very little about the earthly paradise except that it will cover the whole earth. Of course, Mr. Wells himself is under no illusions about the difficulties of making it cover the whole earth. He faces the certainty of difficulty and especially of delay. He is far too shrewd a man to suppose that such deep and delicate traditions would be easy to deracinate, or that his humanitarian empire could rapidly encircle the globe. He does not propose to put a girdle round the earth in forty minutes, or even go round the world in eighty days. But there is another respect in which his argument does sometimes recall such a circular journey and that is when it is something of an argument in a circle. Being unable to create a real planetary patriotism by bringing Martian invaders from another planet, he proposes, apparently, to launch a universal propaganda in the form of universal education. 
But to make this universal, there must surely be a system to universalize it so that it looks to me a little like establishing a world state in order to teach people that it would be well to establish it. Nor is this the only example of such an argument in a circle. He tries to dispose of the difficulty on which I have touched elsewhere, the danger of despotism in any political power so supreme and remote by denying that it need be personal and even in a sense that it need be powerful. He seems to think we could get on with a sort of republic without any president and almost, one might say, a sort of committee without any chairman. I think this utterly untenable, but I may perhaps touch on that topic later in another connection. Anyhow, Mr. Wells defends his acephalous and somewhat amorphous parliament by saying, there will be no war and no diplomacy. This is a circular argument if ever there was one. There will be no war if and because the world state is strong enough to impose peace. We cannot argue from that that the world state need not be strong because there will be no war. If it is weak, there will probably be any number of wars, and it will not be a complete comfort that the little club which pretends to rule the world when it cannot chooses to call them revolutions. But in truth, there will, in any case, be revolutions, which will be quite indistinguishable from wars. There will be revolutions because the reality of these national and local creations will not find anything more real than itself in any of the abstractions now offered as the philosophy of a world state. Whether there might not be a religion that would offer such a reconciling reality might be discussed. Whether there is not already such a religion might be discussed. But that modern humanitarianism is not such a religion is really beyond all discussion. Humanitarianism has no principles even about our duty to humanity. It has no doctrines except doubts, which are just as destructive to any doctrine it might attempt to maintain. It has no way of holding even its own human followers from the most inhumane fancies and speculations. It cannot tell us what to do with a man or a Martian or a microbe. When it talks perpetually about problems, social problems and sexual problems and economic problems, it means that it cannot make up its mind to any solution of any of them. Its philanthropy is simply a phrase and men cannot be governed by perorations. This humanitarianism is a thing far poorer than humanity. It is poorer than humanity as it is, with all its wars and empires and tribal pride and prejudice. That is why people will not break down the wall of their garden to let in this howling wilderness. That is why they will not give up the complex but complete reality called England or Ireland or France for an incomplete and incomprehensible extension. That is why they will not surrender the local for the universal. It is because the universal is so very much lower than the local. It is quite true that the modern world contains many international things as well as national things. And broadly speaking, it is the international things that are base and the national things that are noble. It is quite true that railways are international while rivers are regarded as national. That is why few poets are found riding an ode to a railway and many riding an ode to a river. Usury is international and useful work is generally local. Spies are international and soldiers are generally national. Banks are at their best when they are at their biggest, but guilds of arts and crafts have generally been at their best when possessed of very local liberties. Indeed, the most completely cosmopolitan force of all is a mere cosmopolitan conspiracy, not even openly admitted by the financiers who whisper about it all over the world. The most universal system is actually a secret. 
The scientific prophets sometimes tell us that nations will be brought together by a vast system of aviation as continuous as an overhead railway. But in truth, the cosmopolitan is not establishing something like an overhead railway, but something like a labyrinth of channel tunnels. I do not, of course, connect Mr. Wells with such cynical cosmopolitanism from which nobody could be more remote. I merely point out that the only practical forces fulfilling his definition would fulfill it in a way very divergent from his doctrine. If there is really a republic of the world, it would be much more worldly than public. If there was really no war, it would be because there was a great deal of diplomacy, especially secret diplomacy. It would be worked at best by those peculiar humanitarians who professed to abolish secret diplomacy and did it by means of secret societies. But all this, even at its best, would be very far from Mr. Wells's new vision of the glories of man, or even his old vision of the terrors of Mars. In conclusion, however, I will merely mention one possibility which might also assist his ideal, though it is very much at variance with his idea. It is always possible that modern man may find himself in touch with other worlds in an even wilder sense than that of the War of the Worlds. Psychic inquiry may call up powers claiming to come from another plane instead of another planet. They may career about on four-legged tables instead of three-legged tripods. They may be mirrored in the crystal instead of in the moon. I do not particularly want them or welcome them. On the contrary, in the few glimpses I have caught, they seem as grotesque and unnatural as any of the monsters which he imagined as stalking, like vast spiders about the earth or boiling up like vast bubbles out of the moon. So far as I speculate on any spiritual realities behind them, I have the sense of something as hostile as the most martial Martian. If we do not strive against the stars we have named Mars and Mercury and Jupiter, we may yet strive against some such spirits as the early Christians supposed to be massed under the same names. The notion would probably be rather impatiently repudiated by the author himself, but the notion is not half so useful for my purposes as it would be for his. Here again, it is through what he would reject as an impossibility that he might reach what he would accept as an ideal. But though it is of no concern of mine to call it desirable, and though he himself might regard it as incredible, it is very far from improbable. It is not at all unlikely that through the new scientific interest in abnormal psychological powers, men may come to find that they have let loose things that are a little too powerful, as if they had called down monsters from the moon. Then, indeed, we should again see man against a background that would isolate and unite him, like a single figure striving on a besieged tower against the sky. Such a struggle with psychic influences could not exactly be called a war against nationalism, though it might be a union of nations, but it might be called a war against imperialism, since those psychic influences are now defined by the word control, and it might be called a war against militarism, for their name is Legion. End of section 6section 7 of gk chesterton in the century illustrated magazine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by arden gk chesterton in the century illustrated magazine by gk chesterton the game of psychoanalysis by gilbert k chesterton of psychoanalysis it may be said literally at least in one sense that it is such stuff as dreams are made of. Some of us may be tempted to expand the sense of stuff to the significance of stuff and nonsense, but it is more moderate and more exact to say that this new scientific notion, like many such notions, divides itself into a smaller element, which may in a more serious sense be called stuff, and a much larger element 
which might more correctly be called stuffing. Psychoanalysis can no longer be dismissed as a fad. It has risen to the dignity of a fashion and possesses all that moral authority and intellectual finality which we associate with a particular pattern of hats or whiskers. It stands now in the open street, visible to the man in the street, like some florid and magnificent tailor's dummy outside a tailor's shop. And it is borne in upon me, as a humble passerby, that it is time somebody kicked the stuffing out of it. Footnote. Since this was written, it has been done, more brilliantly than I can pretend to do it, by Miss Rose Macaulay in Dangerous Ages. End footnote. I believe I am strictly observing some of the most tenable tenets of psychoanalysis in not repressing this impulse. It is often suggested by these theorists that the most dreadful results may follow from the inhibition or secretion of such a movement of desire, and who knows what would happen to my moral inside if I really controlled my feelings at the sight of a psychoanalyst. The psychological professor might appear to me in a dream, not to say a nightmare, and my whole life might be poisoned by obstructed passion and the sense of opportunities lost. It is far better to yield to the natural nervous stimulus and liberate the natural human impulse, which may be done either by doubling up suddenly with laughter at the sight of the professor, or possibly by doubling the professor up with some outward gesture appropriate to the occasion. But these suggestions may seem to some to be a little exaggerated, and even to savor of levity. So I will return to my main object in this essay, an object which, like the professors, is quite serious, though perhaps not so solemn. In current controversy, the most sincere and convinced Darwinians are those who do not know what Darwinism is, and doubtless many are already practicing psychoanalysis, with the utmost confidence and commercial success, in a similar condition of nescience about its nature. But in neither case, curiously enough, is it necessarily our first duty to decide what the word means, or ought to mean. We are actually more concerned with the wrong use of such names and things than with the right use of them. The right use of them is a comparatively thin and theoretic business, quite logical and legitimate in its place, but confined in that place to a very small company of competent specialists. The wrong use of them is a huge historical event, a revolution, a thing affecting thousands. The story of the South Sea bubble is not told by tracing something that happened in an island in the South Seas. The important thing was not any far off fact, but the central and civilized fable or delusion. Indeed, this is just as true when the excitement is not altogether a delusion. A man might live for a long time unperturbed by popular excitement about polar expeditions if he had taken the precaution of living at the North Pole. But in any case, a theory is only a thought, while a fashion is a fact. If certain things have really taken hold of the centers of civilization, they play quite as much a part in history whether their ultimate origin is a misapprehension or no. If certain Mahatmas are being worshipped by everybody of importance in Paris and London, it is in practice a lesser matter whether they are suspected of heresy in the interior of Tibet. And if certain society dances, admittedly of African origin, are regarded as graceful and alluring, by the aristocrats of Europe and America, it will make little difference that they would be regarded as obscene and degrading by the very cannibals of Africa. The truth is that the nucleus of genuine psychological study has little or nothing to do with the fashion of psychoanalysis, just as the nucleus of genuine biological study had very little to do with the pantomime popularity of the missing link. Insofar as that strictly scientific science really does exist, it has, amid its high merits, certain marks which unfit it to be a fashion of this kind, just as a really subtle medical diagnosis could never express itself in a patent medicine. It has one mark, especially, which I have described more fully in another article, but which is fatal to it as a fashion. It is a characteristic of sincere scientific speculation that it cannot, at any given moment, be applied generally to public affairs, except with the utmost caution and the most copious dilutions of common sense. This is because of the very nature of scientific inquiry, which, even when it does advance, advances by a sort of self-correcting curve that often brings it back almost to the place where it began. Considered as a process, it may be only fulfilling itself, but considered as a practical answer to a problem, it may come near to contradicting itself. To take this case of psychology in its most elementary example, science might incline to the view that counting does send a man to sleep. And then science might explain this by the fact that the first numerals are short words, or are very familiar and flowing ones. 
and science would be bound to add that these first numbers are very few, that the opposite examples are infinitely more numerous, the infinity being literal, that the expression 1597 is not strictly speaking a monosyllable, and that few of us are familiar with the habit of asking for 173 hats or 217 railway tickets. So science, following the same line of logic, would probably begin by telling us to count and end by telling us not to count. Similarly, she would probably find special deflections in every special variation of it. As in the common advice to the sleepless to count the sheep climbing a fence and falling into a ditch, or to count the society ladies going to call on a psychoanalyst. Hence, I am not concerned to deny that somewhere in the core of this craze, or more probably quite remote from it, there is some careful and solid work being done in the testing of memory, subconsciousness, and association of ideas. But exactly insofar as it is in this sense a fact, it is incapable of becoming in this sense a fashion. Nor do I deny, as will be seen later, that even the fashion itself is in some ways a healthy reaction against things even more unhealthy than itself. But for the moment, I am writing of the only psychoanalysis of which everybody is talking. I might say of the only psychoanalysis of which anybody has heard. This is a reality. This is a thing of increasingly general experience. And this threatens to be a nonsensical nuisance and nothing else. Before men analyze the uses of the unconscious mind, it may, perhaps, be well for them to discover the use of the mind. And before we come in this connection to any consideration of results, it may be well to say a word about methods. Now, the passages most eagerly quoted from the thinkers most ardently admired in this school of philosophy are generally enough to show that whether or no they could theorize, they certainly could not think. One of them is admired and quoted for his theory of the character of Hamlet, according to which Hamlet not only hated his uncle, which even a mere literary critic with no scientific training might possibly be able to conjecture, but that he also secretly hated his father simply for loving his mother. I know not what one is expected to do with this sort of thing except laugh, unless it be urged that it is inhumane to laugh at lunatics. The professor might just as well reconstruct the real, but rigidly concealed character of Ariel, deducing it from the observed effects of hypnotism as probably practiced by Sycorax. He might as well interpret the Midsummer Night's Dream by psychoanalyzing the dreams of moth and cobweb. Few of us, I fancy, wish to be entangled in such cobwebs. Most of us would be decidedly relieved if Puck, another promising subject for psychoanalysis, would come with his broom to sweep such dust, not to say dirt, behind the door. 2. There is another great phrase in the same play, which will probably recur to the mind of any critic who thinks that criticism has any connection with common sense. The best in this kind are but shadows, and Hamlet is only a gigantic shadow, even if he be the best in this kind. That a professor should earnestly attempt to dissect a shadow, to apply his scalpel to the inmost organs of a shadow, and show the hidden deformities of a shadow, is a sort of nightmare of unreality. It is a waking dream more monstrously incomprehensible than any of the sleeping dreams such doctors seek to comprehend. Even an unscientific scribbler may be permitted, as I say, to form his own opinion upon such a way of forming any opinions. He may be legitimately alarmed at the notion of such doctors applying their test to life as they apply it to literature. Another of them noted some slip of the pen by a man who was putting off an unpleasant interview on the plea of unforeseen difficulties, or some such phrase, and who found he had written foreseen instead of unforeseen. This is gravely quoted as a proof of the existence and grand vigilant veracity of the great unconscious mind, which had suddenly snatched the pen from his hand and crossed out the negative prefix. In that case, we can only say that the unconscious mind must be as bad a logician as the professor who was expounding it. For what the man really knew in his conscience was not that he had foreseen difficulties and neglected to remove them, but that he was going to tell a thumping lie in saying there were any difficulties at all. But here again, who can take such things seriously for a moment, or the judgment of anybody who thinks them serious? What does it matter how many facts the scientific specialist has collected, if these are the sort of facts he collects, and this is the sort of way he argues on them? The suggestion opens up a rather terrifying interpretation of the morality of misprints or clerical errors. Is any man who hastily writes shooting peasants when he means shooting pheasants? 
to be looked on as a homicidal maniac is any careless or short-sighted person who puts hat instead of had to be treated as a sort of mad hatter instead of a sane man momentarily talking through his hat. A misprint famous in Fleet Street made Mr. Gladstone say, my honorable friend shaves his head instead of shakes his head. Was the printer a monomaniac not to be trusted with a razor? I myself have left out the second R in correspondent in writing hastily about a respectable non-conformist gentleman so that it nearly came out in print as co-respondent. Is it to be inferred that my subconscious mind was surging with a dreadful knowledge of his profligate life, or that the terrible truth ran through all my dreams, in which the nonconformist was perpetually figuring in a dance of dissolute love affairs and scandalous escapades? I give these merely as examples of an extravagant laxity in the mere process of reasoning, apart from its results. But we find very much the same untrustworthy logic and unconscious humor when we come to the results themselves. 3. The mark of this sort of psychoanalyst is that he is always talking about complexes and seems never to have heard of complexity. The first thing to note about the movement as a whole is that it is one of a historic series of such movements which may be called the insane simplifications. Each of them took not so much a half-truth as a hundredth part of a truth and then offered it not merely as something but as everything. Having never done anything except split hairs, it hangs the whole world on a single hair. Perhaps the first forerunners of this modern type were the Calvinists, who dug out the deep and most mysterious matter of divine foreknowledge, and forced it to the destruction of every other divine attribute, and their modern descendants, the determinists, who so denied all choice as to make it impossible even to choose what they called truth in preference to what they called falsehood. But a more recognizable prototype was the disciple of the utilitarians who paraded their formula of universal self-interest with the same air of ruthless logic, though indeed the point was almost as verbal as a pun. Indeed, the utilitarians used the word self very much as the psychoanalysts used the word sex. The Calvinists, the utilitarians, and all such men of one idea were preeminently intellectual bullies. Their object in using these harsh and insufficient terms was a notion of making our flesh creep by giving ugly names to natural or ordinary things. It is obvious that the fulfillment of any ideal can be found only in a conscious soul, that is, in a self, and it tickled their vanity to make a sort of savage pun and call this selfishness. But it is obvious that if we so distend the meaning of a word as to say a man is self-indulgent when he wants to be burned alive, we are merely giving an illogical shock by using a bad word for what is better expressed in better words. In the same way, it is obvious that if we spread an alleged atmosphere of sex over all natural expansion towards beauty and pleasure, we can really do it only by taking all the sting out of the word sex as the other took all the sting out of the word self. In both cases, the intellectual pleasure is on about the same level as that of a schoolboy who frightens his little sisters by talking like an ogre about blood when he has cut his finger. The same irrationality, which consists in taking what is at best a very minute, obscure, and doubtful part of the truth, and blazoning it abroad as the one all-sufficing truth, can be seen in the whole psychoanalytical business about the sexual character of all sorts of non-sexual affections. That the sexual instinct is very strong is self-evident and that it is often difficult to say how much it may faintly color other things is quite equally self-evident. But the way in which some psychoanalysts talk about the mother complex would certainly indicate that a mother is rather too complex a thing for their intellects to analyze. Their tone amounts to the implication not so much that there is such a thing as the sex instinct as that there is no such thing as the maternal instinct. On this theory, a hen must be entirely indifferent to pullets and exclusively interested in cockerels. The male swallow or sparrow, when bringing food to the family nest, doubtless stipulates that it shall be distributed first to the female birds, while the mother promptly proceeds to reverse the process. These examples appear absurd, but they are not an atom more absurd to anyone with any experience of human families than the implication that mothers do not care much about daughters, or that fathers never concentrate on sons. The fact is that the general parental feeling, which is the one force running through nature, is also by far the most powerful and determining force running through human nature. 
in this connection, and all we can put to balance it, in the realities of experience and common sense, is that there may be, under certain conditions, a sort of shadow of sex sentiment mingling with the romance of any affection in the perfectly innocent and even frivolous sense of an interest in the other sex. The proportions of it are imperceptible and probably invisibly small, but it is the whole point of such monomaniac schools of thought that they care nothing whatever about proportion. The thing which is new for them always bulks big in the universe, without any reference to what is true for everybody. For the rest, any sane man will certainly say that this, if it exists, is a part of the unconscious mind, which had much better remain unconscious. But it is yet another mark of this sort of agnostic, that he is ready to assert his absolute knowledge of everything to the verge of a contradiction in terms. Just as he will always try to write a history of prehistoric man, so he will always struggle to be conscious of his own unconsciousness. And behind all this, as behind the diabolism of the Calvinist and the materialism of the utilitarian, there is in many cases a mood or a motive which is simply a silly pleasure in brutality and blasphemy. The same sort of thrill that was given by saying that most men were damned, or that all men were selfish, is given by suggesting, however absurdly, that holy motherhood, or the love of little children, has in it something of the unearthly darkness of Oedipus. 4. Even in these unnatural schools, doubtless, this mood is rare, and generally, to use their own favorite word, unconscious. But the same parallel can be found in many political and ethical schools of recent times, and in connections that are cleaner, if quite equally pedantic. Just as it is the latest fad to prove that everything is sexual, so it was the last fad but one to prove that everything was economic. The Marxian notion, called the materialist theory of history, had the same sort of stupid self-confidence in its very insufficient materialism. As the one fad conceives everything about the bird to be connected with mating, so the other conceived everything connected with it to consist of catching worms. It would be inadequate even about birds, and we ourselves are not limited to a taste for catching worms, and still less for being worms. But the most vital answer was, of course, that birds have no history, but only natural history. In so far as it is true that birds do nothing but feed and breed, they do nothing worthy of record, and nothing is recorded, and that is why we have no great historical works on the golden deeds of goldfinches, or the lives of famous larks. The whole type of thought in both cases rests on an intellectual confusion between the constant conditions of living and the determining motives of life. It is obvious that life could not continue if sex and food were entirely absent, but that has nothing in the world to do with how frequently they are present. It had certainly nothing to do with how frequently they are present, as motives explaining decisive events. It is exactly as if we were to say that because a man stands everywhere, or goes anywhere supported on two legs, therefore his two legs are his only interests in life. It is like suggesting that his whole heaven must be in the contemplation and admiration of his legs, that if he runs to catch a train, it must be to exercise his legs, or if he looks to inherit a fortune, it must be to buy boots. Certainly man can only stand on the earth and advance down the ages on the two physical supports of alimentation and reproduction, but that he is perpetually thinking about these things is not only flatly contradicted by the whole of his history, but is really inconsistent with his having any history. It was said of Sir Willoughby Pattern that he had a leg, and we may even make the bold scientific inference that he had two legs, but if there were nothing but two legs, there would be no romance called the egoist. And if there were nothing but these material supports, there would be no romance called the Roman Empire, or the Crusades, or the French Revolution, or the Great War. In the case of the materialist theory of history, reason has already begun to return even to the materialist, the shrewdest and most hard-headed of the Marxians, such as that very virile veteran, Mr. Heinemann, have already seen through and corrected this very crude economic formula. Even the wildest and most dehumanized of the Marxians are no longer talking very much about the materialist theory of history. In their own realm of Russia, indeed, they are talking mostly about the necessity of strike breaking and servile labor. The monomania of economic history is already passing, as the monomania of utilitarianism had passed before it, and the monomania of Calvinistic determinism before that. 
it was time for another monomania to appear. The monomania of the omnipresence of sex, like the last monomania of the omnipresence of economics, could easily be refuted at length and at large. For the purposes of brevity, either is best referred to the daily experience of any ordinary man. Just as any ordinary man who has fallen in love, or got drunk with his friends, or gone for a walk in the country, knows that there are a number of normal motives that are not economic. So any grown man who has ever looked with pleasure at a little boy of three or four knows that the father complex is all nonsense, and that his pleasure is mingled of many things which psychoanalysis does not analyze, but largely of something of which psychoanalysis would seem to be quite unaware, the sense of the absurd. In a very short time, no doubt, everybody will be pointing out these palpable absurdities in the current psychological fashion, just as they are already beginning to point out the absurdities in the last economic fashion, and have been long pointing out those in the former economic fashion and the yet earlier theological fashion. These fads fade very fast, and it may seem hardly worthwhile to prick bubbles that will burst of themselves. Nevertheless, there is one consideration that makes it worthwhile. It is a character of all these manias that they cannot really convince the mind, but they do cloud it. Above all, they do darken it. All these tremendous and rather temporary discoveries have had the singular fascination that they were not merely degrading, but were also depressing. Each in turn leaves no trace on the true and serious conclusions of the world, but each in turn may leave very deep and disastrous wounds and dislocations in the mentality of the individual man. Calvinism is dead, but not before Cowper died of it. In short, the real case against the new psychology is purely psychological. Where it is not worth watching as a science, it is worth watching as a disease. Perhaps, however, the best simile is that of the watch kept beside a restless sleeper, tossing in fever or delirium in which one delusion chases another. These things in very truth are of such stuff as dreams are made of, and never more than when they themselves seek for signs and portents in dreams. A nightmare is never true, and a nightmare is never lasting, but it always towers above the stars and occupies heaven and earth while it lasts. It would be a kindness to give people a passing pinch to wake them up. 5. Of course there are other things in psychoanalysis besides this craze for reading the single sexual instinct into all sorts of other instincts and ideas. Of some of them, perhaps, I may write more generally on another occasion, and I will only briefly refer to them here. The idée fixe about the indirect influence of sex is sufficiently typical of the trend of such things and the main truth about them. But the main truth about psychoanalysis is simply that it is not analysis. It does not really analyze at all, for to analyze is to resolve a reality into all its constituents. In the case of the soul, this cannot be done perfectly and these doctors do it much more imperfectly even than it might be done. They find their favorite cause in cases where it would be the business of an analyst to find five or six causes, and their complexes really remain complex. But above all, they are dealing with a complex which must remain more complex than the cosmos itself. The other great subject matter of psychoanalysis, besides the sex instinct, is the unconscious mind. It is self-evident that nobody can analyze the unconscious mind. Nobody can cut up the whole of it into the smallest pieces, count all the pieces, and be certain that none is missing. The most we can do is to become aware of the thing, or of adumbrations of the thing, much as psychic investigators claim to do of the psychic world, not even knowing whether the things seen are significant or insignificant as compared with the things not seen. Indeed, it is obvious that among the possibilities of a subconscious mind are all the psychic possibilities. The moment a thing is outside the lighted circle of consciousness, we cannot be certain what allies it has in the darkness. Indeed, we cannot even be certain whether it belongs to us or not. If a prompting comes from nowhere, of which we are conscious, obviously we cannot even be conscious that it comes only from our own unconsciousness. So far as we know, it is news from nowhere, and so far as we merely guess, it might be news from anywhere. We cannot conjecture the mere existence of an undiscovered country and then calmly map out the frontier between that undiscovered country and another undiscovered country. We are improving on the philosopher who said that the snark was a boojum merely by asserting on our own authority that the snark is strictly forbidden to be a boojum 
That is all we are rationalistically entitled to say of the region beyond our conscious reason, that it may contain anything from heaven to hell. Turn from this to the fantastic fashion plate now in vogue in which the subconscious man is already photographed as huge and hairy as his predecessor, the missing link. Now, alas, no more. The minor poetry, the fashionable fiction, the talk of the drawing room, and the tags of the newspaper are full of some ridiculous mythology about every man having inside him a sort of aged and microcephalous monkey. Wistful and melancholy poems are written about how trying it is for a man to have a monkey inside him, and ethical essays earnestly debate whether the man should own the monkey or the monkey the man. Men are forgetting that unconsciousness is unconscious, exactly as they forgot that the missing link was missing. They are making a picture of the subconscious man exactly as they made a picture of the Superman. In the existing atmosphere of the thing, if it does not indeed pass like a fashion, it can only remain as a superstition. The modern world may or may not recover a religion, but it is rapidly making a mythology. 6. It is with this mythology that I have been dealing here, as threatening to be a superstition fit for savages, and not with the minimum of true medicinal treatment for the mind, which would require another sort of article to itself. Even in that subject of the medicine, there would be too much that savors of the medicine man. But I do not at all deny that, in the hands of men truly scientific and preferably sane, much may be done in the disentangling of morbid memories or unnatural associations. But by far, the best case for this better side of the business is to be found in another historical retrospect of the time before Calvinism began the dance of the modern monomanias. Our civilization before the Calvinist philosophy was possessed of the Catholic philosophy. The Puritans destroyed the institutions of medieval Christianity one after another, and the moderns have been driven to restore them one after another. The only difference is that the same thing which had a moderate medieval form generally has an extravagant modern form. The cult of feminism has made nonsense of the protests against mariolatry. There are wild Protestant sects in America at this moment, which would still probably refuse honor to the mother of God, while they are already asking why God is not called a mother. The cult of aestheticism made nonsense of the protests against ritualism. William Morris actually put on his wallpapers the symbols that Christians were forbidden to put on their walls. And because men might not say the litany of the Virgin reverently, Swinburne rewrote it for them blasphemously and addressed it to a harlot. Because it was superstitious of the monks to practice communism on a small scale, everybody is commanded by the Bolshevists to practice it on a colossal scale. And because we destroyed democratic guilds that were conservative, we are rewarded with trades unions that are revolutionary. The modern world rejected as incredible the medieval miracles that were worked by relics in holy places, and has gone off to work its own miracles with tables and tambourines. It has denied that a dead man could possibly have a glorified body, and lived to hear its most eminent scientists saying that he can have a glorified golf club and a glorified brandy and soda. There is not a single one of the institutions denounced and destroyed as parts of medieval society that has not by this time been painfully parodied as a part of modern society. There was perhaps only one lacking, and it has now been supplied. Psychoanalysis is the restoration of the confessional. The modern world has really suffered from a monstrous burden of secrecy. Perpetually talking of enlightenment and public opinion it has had more privacy in the bad sense than any previous age. Its conservative politics are sustained by secret party funds its revolutionary politics by secret societies. In emotional matters, it has grown still more stagnant and poisonous, and the healthiest aspect of the new psychology is that it is the bursting of that secretion. On the practical side, the comparison remains the same. Whether or not it can do all the alleged good that the confessional does, it could certainly do all the alleged harm that the confessional was accused of doing. It confesses to every count in the old indictment, the unseemliness of the subject matter, the possible unworthiness of the recipient. Indeed, the vulgar charge is much plainer against a casual experimentalist than against a self-dedicated celibate. 
A priest may be a systematic profligate and break his vows, but it is not immediately obvious why a systematic profligate should have any vows to break. But all this comparison is beyond the question here. It is enough to say that in this, also, the modern world dubiously copies the medieval world, which is furiously condemned, and that if this be a fault, it is the nearest the thing comes to a virtue. End of section 7. Read by Arden. June 11. End of G.K. Chesterton in the Century Illustrated Magazine by G.K. Chesterton.